thanks everybody for coming. Um, I'm not quite sure where everybody is right now. I think we're kind of in all kinds of time zones. So whatever time of day it is, welcome. Um, and I hope, uh, I hope if you're in China, you've had some coffee, so I don't put you to sleep with my story. Um, and uh, I just wanted to say that this is gonna be a little bit different probably than most presentations you've seen. I'm not gonna kill you with uh, slides. This is really more about storytelling and it's my story. Uh, so if you are a big PowerPoint fan, I'm sorry, I apologize in advance. Um, I wanted to start off telling you a very quick story about how my career began. And like many of you, I started as a staff accountant. I was very ambitious. Uh, I was an entrepreneur from the time I was eight years old. I delivered newspapers. I cut lawns in my neighborhood. I'd do anything for a couple bucks in the, in the neighborhood. Uh, I was excited to go to college, get a business degree. And I was really looking to light the world on fire. Only a couple of weeks after I got my degree, I started with uh, EY. I was really proud of that, uh, to be starting with one of the more prestigious firms in the industry. And uh, I really just couldn't even believe it. Uh, and I was ready to go. Um, I was thrilled when I started it. I was working with these super smart people at EY, um, being called out to client sites, working on some really interesting businesses. And about two months in, um, as many of you might have, might have had this experience, I was scheduled to do a, um, a week's training in Dallas. Uh, this was gonna be my first business trip. I had never been on a business trip before. It sounds like a really adult thing, right? Um, and frankly, this was actually gonna be my second time on an airplane, if you can believe that. Um, and I was scheduled to fly out on a Sunday morning. Uh, however, uh, I never made that trip. And I ended up on a different trip. I ended up on an emergency trip to the hospital. Uh, that Saturday night before, my temperature spiked up to 103.5 degrees, which you probably know is a pretty dangerous level for people at uh, an adult age anyway. Uh, I was drenched in sweat. I was shaking uncontrollably. Um, my friends took me to the hospital. Instead of training for my career for that week, I spent the week in the hospital and we were just trying to learn how uh, this uh, fever had happened and what caused it. Uh, that was not how I envisioned starting my career, I have to say. I spent the week worrying about what people would have thought of me. Was I going to lose my job? Uh, had I made a mistake taking on this job? Did I even belong here? And frankly, what was going to happen to me next from a health perspective? And Really, I mean, these were heavy questions for a young, ambitious guy who had only logged eight weeks into what would be a nearly 40-year career of success, obstacles, challenges. I learned early on that challenges and obstacles were going to be a constant in my life. So I'm sharing this story with you, hopefully to inspire you to think differently about limitations, and to challenge yourself, to achieve things that you never thought possible. Um, to be clear, it took me decades to fully understand and appreciate these lessons that I've learned. And I hope by sharing them a few, uh, few of those with you today, you'd be able to use them in your careers and your life journey. Um, it's my personal story. Um, uh, it's not meant to cast me as some superhero or some extraordinary person. I haven't climbed Mount Everest. I'm probably like a lot of you just trying to be the best person I can be. So what I'd like to do is start with what I call the tale of two resumes. And to set the stage, um, I want to show you a, and if I, I apologize if I don't do this right, I'm going to try to share my screen here. Um, hold on one second. Bear with me. So here's a quick snapshot of 40 years. And as you can see, it's a pretty good progression. Started as a staff accountant, as I said, progressed up the ranks. And I spent the last 14 years of my career in the C-suite. I did two CFO gigs. I did two COO gigs. Uh, I ended up being a CEO of a company. Uh, we had uh, offices in 14 countries, including China, Shanghai. 
and I'm currently an executive coach. So it's been a really, really uh, great ride. Um, along the way, I got married um, I went to my wife, Claudia. We've been married for 37 years. We have three adult kids. We've got one grandchild, a quick shot on the family here. Uh, and I got another grandchild on the way. Uh, so it's really, it's been an amazing life, I have to say. Let me just stop the screen share for a second. And come back to you. Um, so now what I want to do is I want to, actually, I should have probably just left that up. Um, I'm going to show you a different resume. And this is a resume that was built um, alongside of my career resume. Um, it was uh, one that, frankly, I was not looking to have um, and uh, and not one I would wish on anybody, frankly. Um, over the years, I've, I was diagnosed with Crohn's 45 years ago when I was 16 years old. Um, I've had 66 uh, surgeries, procedures that required anesthesia. Uh, some of the more significant ones, five resections where I had 12 feet of my intestines removed. And just for context, uh, the human body has 15 small bowel, uh, and I've only got about three left. It's really not enough, I'll tell you. Uh, I've had two colostomy surgeries, two kidney surgeries. Um, and just for fun, I've had about 40 co uh, uh, colonoscopies along the years. So uh, tons of fun. Um, currently, I have Crohn's. It's something I deal with every day. I have a condition called short gut syndrome. Uh, it's an inability to absorb enough nutrients because of all the surgeries I've had. I have chronic kidney disease uh, from, uh, I produce tons and tons of kidney stones and I've had surgeries. Uh, and that's all due to the alterations that uh, has been done to my anatomy. Um, I have osteoporosis from taking steroids uh, early on to control the Crohn's. I've had acute episodes that required a medical treatment right away. I've had blockages. Uh, I actually can remember once coming home from uh, London and taking the car service right to the emergency room. Um, I've had intestinal bleeding. I've had pneumonia from allergies. And as I said, I've had tons and tons of uh, fevers uh, that were really high that required immediate attention. Well, let me stop that chair for a second and come back. Sorry for the jumping back and forth. Um, all right. So I hope I didn't scare you with all of that information. Um, it's an impressive resume, right? Um, only in a very different way. And um, as I said, I wouldn't wish it on anybody. So it's hard to encapsulate 40 years in like 30 minutes. I'm going to talk for about 30 minutes here. Um, so I picked four stories and lessons that I want to share today and give you something to reflect on after each one of them. And so let's dive right into the first one. First one is uh, what I say is limitations and obstacles are controlled on the inside, not the outside. So when I was 16, I was a typical teenager. I was hanging out with friends, I was into cars, was on the running team at school. Um, I had a job at a gas station, really just to fill my tank from my 1972 Chevy. That, burn so much gas, uh, full energy, full ambition. And what I didn't know was life was going to throw me a curveball and it was going to change me forever. I used to go to that gas station job every night, not every night, almost every night. I'd work till about 9 p.m. The nights were really dark and cold. Um, the only thing that really cut the night was those neon lights above the gas pumps and uh, barely drinkable coffee on the inside of the office, those old coffee machines. And across the parking lot was this place called the Sycamore Drive-In. And it was this classic 50s style burger joint. And due to its proximity, I could run over there and grab dinner while I was on my shift. And the Sycamore made these incredible uh, smash burgers, if you know what a smash burger is. And they'd load them up with everything you can think of, pile them up, and they called it the Sycamore Dagwood Burger. And these were a absolutely magnificent, greasy creation that would make any 16-year-old boy smile, I have to tell you. Devouring one of those on a cold February night made everything right in the world until it didn't. 
about 30 minutes after I'd have one of these, I'd find myself doubled over in pain. I'd be suffering for the rest of the night and just dying to get home comfort in my bed. And over time, the consequences of these late night indulgences started to really take their toll on me. I had increasing pain, fatigue. I convinced myself that I was killing myself with Dagwood burgers. Uh, I was falling behind at school. I had to stop working at that job. All I could do was to get through a, a day at school and I would come home and sleep the rest of the day. I was losing weight, uh, really wasn't eating. And what I realized is I wasn't being killed by Dagwood burgers, obviously, but my immune system was, it was attacking me and causing severe inflammation in my intestines. So I ended up at Yale New Haven Hospital, and that's where they diagnosed me with Crohn's. And it's a debilitating disease. Uh, it was relatively unknown at the time, no known cure, uh, and no known cause. But what they did know is I'd have it for the rest of my life. Treatment options were limited to steroids at the time. Uh, they really had nothing else, and surgery was probable. Receiving that news was pretty overwhelming, I have to admit. A um, couple months prior, I was carefree, no, nothing holding me back, not a care in the world. Uh, I know now that I, I didn't totally comprehend uh, what was being told to me at that point. I just wanted to get back to my life, get back to school, friends. Sure enough, I took a week's worth of steroids. If you've ever been on them, they're a miracle drug. Uh, you just don't want to take them for very long. Um, pain went away. I was eating tons of energy. And I thought to myself, thank God that's over. And obviously, my 16-year-old uh, brain had not comprehended that this was a chronic illness and it would be with me forever. Um, so over the next year, I'd have my good days, bad days. I did manage to graduate uh, and I got into college, which was not too bad. I was doing OK. Uh, during the summer between my freshman and sophomore years of college, uh, this is when I would really learn how severe this could be. Scans showed that inflammation had done its damage and I was uh, out of options and had to have surgery to remove the sections that were damaged. Uh, this was before laparoscopic. Uh, so they would have to do a about a 12 to 14 inch uh, midline abdominal incision. This is not an easy surgery by any stretch of the imagination. But while I was recovering in the hospital, I had one of the most profound events of my life, I have to say. I, was, I wasn't visited by an angel. This wasn't some near-death experience in a bright light. So that's not what we're talking about here. It was really more of like a regular day of pain meds, just trying to walk a few steps to the nurse's station and just trying to recover. I was being cared for by this really wise old nurse. I was having a tough day. I was exhausted from the surgery, a lot of pain. Um, and this nurse, she looked me straight in the eye and with a very calm, but forceful voice, she said something to me that I never forgot. And it changed my entire view uh, in life to this day. She said to me, don't you ever use this as an excuse and don't ever let it stop you. I have to say, I was a bit stunned when she said this to me. I was thinking, really, is this what I need to hear? Uh, well, all I'm trying to do is walk a couple of steps and get out of bed. I don't even think I responded to her in hindsight. But these words, this mantra, it never left me. And over 40 years later, I remember that moment like it was yesterday. This was a seemingly benign conversation we were having, and it produced the most prophetic and impactful piece of wisdom that would guide me through every difficult time in my life. The power of those words and the impact on me they evolved over time, so obviously it didn't. It wasn't like some lightning bolt hit me. But over the course of time, as I'd keep getting jabbed and a and couple uppercuts from this illness uh, that would sting me or knock me down on the mat, that's when it evolved and I started to realize how impactful it was. And what I learned is this. Although many of the challenges we face are limitations, they're thrust upon us from the outside, the impact that they have on us is completely controlled on the inside. You're not judged by the number of times you get knocked down. You judge by the how, how many times you get up and how you respond to getting up. 
Sometimes you may have to make adjustments, different approaches. Sometimes you have to get creative and you got to do a workaround. But it's our overall attitude towards those challenges that creates the ultimate outcome. I thought this was incredibly summed up in a quote by Viktor Frankl, and, you know, and most of you will know he was a Holocaust survivor. And he said this, when we no longer are able to change a situation, we're challenged to change ourselves. Couldn't be more true. Couldn't change the fact that I had this disease. It wasn't something I did that caused it, but it could change the way I would deal with it. And this is applicable to so many things in our lives and our careers. We face challenges and obstacles every day. I'm sure you probably had some today. Um, they can be trivial, they can be very profound, yet we always, always have a choice in how we're gonna to respond to that. That's, that's something no one can take away from us. And that response, that can either bury you or it can lift you to heights you never thought possible. I had a choice. I could have blamed the world for this illness. I could have felt sorry for myself or just curled up in a ball in the corner and let life pass me by. And trust me, I had moments for all of those emotions, every one of them. But I kept coming back to those words and the realization I always had a choice. A choice to pick path I wanted to take, might hit some roadblocks, might hit some detours, but the, ultimately I would experience the journey fully no matter which, which way it led me. Uh, let me just see if I can pop up this next slide for you without too much problem. Sorry. So I just wanted to give you a couple of couple of questions to reflect on after hearing this story. Um, and those are when you're approaching a challenge, do you approach it with excuses and blame or ownership and creativity? This is where we can really change the dynamic because things can be thrust upon us. Not everything is, but sometimes it is. And if we can take ownership that it's our situation and be creative about it, we can respond appropriately. Can you change the situation you're in? Sometimes you can. Sometimes situations are coming from the inside. We're creating the situation. Maybe we could change it. But if not, how can you choose to address it? And finally, are you operating reactively when something's coming at you? Or are you proactively attacking it from the inside out? If something's hitting you, are you being creative? Are you taking ownership of it? A few things to think about. Let me stop this share for a second. We'll go on to lesson two. Bear with me. All right, lesson two. This one I like to call, are you playing to win or not to lose. So one of my most defining times in my career uh, was when I was working for Hyperion. And if I believe it's all finance folks on the call, um, some of you may be using Hyperion today to do your consolidations. It's the same Hyperion. Um, I started at Hyperion as an accounting manager. Uh, as soon as I started, I was paired up with this director of corporate development. Uh, I was providing financial support for uh, the back end of some of the acquisitions and partnerships we were doing. It was pretty good work. I liked it. I think I did a pretty good job at it. Um, I was only on the job for six months when that director of corporate development, he quit. And a few weeks passed and there was this knock on my door uh, and it would turn out to be this career defining moment for me. The CFO stood at my door and said, Jim, who was the CEO at the time, Jim and I would like you to take this corporate development job, the director of corporate development. And I have to say, it, it totally caught me off guard. I didn't see this coming. Um, I was just an accounting manager who had just started. Um, I'd only been on the job for six months. Even worse, I'd only been in the software industry for six months. I never worked out of a finance job before. <laughs> I thought maybe, maybe she knocked on the wrong door. I don't know. Um, but I wasn't, I wasn't expecting that to happen. Um, 
I was being asked to take on a job that would require me to source and execute all of our acquisitions, partnerships, and strategic alliances. Um, I'm the type of guy who's up for a challenge. I like trying new things, but this seemed like an absolutely massive leap for me. Um, a voice in my head immediately popped in saying, you can't do this. And that voice was my inner critic. We all have inner critics. We all have self-limiting beliefs. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. That voice in your head that tells you you're not good enough, can't do it, you're an imposter, and somehow by some miraculous mistake in the universe, you've ended up in the position you're in and everybody was snowed by you, right? I'm sure you've all seen it. The truth is your inner critic is not you. And it certainly tries to take over your brain, tries to control your thinking, but allowing that inner critic too much space can totally sap our energy. It can limit us from taking risks and limit us from seizing opportunities that are out there for us. I'm sure you have all experienced it. Anybody experience inner critic? Hand? Yeah. If you didn't put your hand up, I'd, I'd say you're not telling the truth because I think we've all had it. Um, even worse, if everybody on the phone is a finance person, uh, we're hardwired to reduce risk. We're supposed to be skeptical. We're supposed to protect the organization. Feeds almost right into that, right? It's part of our jobs. But making that leap from being a straight finance person to being a strategic voice and running and growing a business, it takes a whole new way of thinking. We need to allow ourselves to think bigger. We have to focus on the opportunity first, what's possible before we start thinking about the limitations. Uh, if you know the country singer, Chris Stapleton, may maybe some of you do, he has a line in one of his songs, which I think is great. And it goes like this, no one wins that's afraid of losing. And that couldn't be more true. I was faced with a big choice here. Do I go for the win or do I try not to lose? My inner critic was loud. What if you fail? You have no right taking this job. What if your illness stops you from succeeding? You'll never find another job if you, if you fail at this. The trick I've learned is that you need to separate yourself from this inner critic. You need to quiet that voice. Let me tell you, it never leaves you. It's always there. That's a fact. But you have a choice in what role it's gonna play in your life. The first step is realizing when it appears and recognizing for what it is. This is something we work on a lot in coaching. I managed to quiet that inner critic by looking at some facts in my life. Now, here's a pro tip about inner critics. Inner critics don't deal in facts and they make excuses. I listed the attributes I could bring to the table. I'd worked on some of the deals before, not all of them, but I did a pretty good job on parts of it. I was confident smart, quick learner. And I had climbed some pretty big mountains already in my life, and this was not as big as those. I didn't ask for the job. CEO, CFO came to me. So obviously they thought I was capable, even though my inner critic was saying I'm not capable. Um, and just like when I was diagnosed, I just was not going to sit and watch life pass me by. No excuses and no stopping. After a lot of soul searching, I took that job. Now, I will tell you, it proved to be an extremely challenging job. I would go to meetings. I felt like everybody was speaking a different language. I'd run back to my desk. I'd look up technical terms related to the software business. I'd try to understand what people were talking about. My inner critic appeared so many times in that job. Pop in, I told you, can't do it. But I kept pushing it aside uh, and I kept going. And in the end, that was the most pivotal job ever. It gave me such incredible confidence. I was thinking, if I could do this, I could do anything. And it broadened and completely changed my perspective and skill set. I learned all aspects of the business, from sales and marketing to R&D to customer service, legal, you name it. I had to touch every bit of that business, far beyond what I had ever done before. And I truly believe that that job was what set me on the path to eventually become a CEO.
And I hate to think what would have happened if I had listened to that inner critic and passed up that opportunity. So that's lesson number two. Let me stop one second and put up my slide here. Bear with me, I'm not a great Zoom guy. There we go. So there's the Chris Stapleton. If you ever get a chance to listen to that song. Um, so again, a couple of questions for you to think about as you reflect on this story. Do you start by assessing limitations or do you focus on what's possible first? I will tell you, I was guilty of this in, early in my career, immediately going to, okay, what could go wrong here versus what could go right? Are you playing it safe or are you going for that win? This is a lesson that has really transformed me because it's easy to think, okay, take the safe route, make sure you don't lose, but ultimately going for the win, that's how you really propel yourself forward. And that inner critic, does it control you or do you control that inner critic? How loud is that voice of the inner critic and can you tame it down? We'll share these slides. So if you, uh, I see some people taking some pictures and things. So um, anyway, that was lesson two. Okay, let's move on. All right, lesson three, we're getting there. Everybody still with me? All right, see Donald shaking his head over there. It's good. All right, this one is actually kind of straightforward. You may have heard this one before, but asking for help is a strength. It's not a weakness. Sometimes it's a lot harder to ask for help. Uh, I've always been this fiercely independent person. My self-reliance, desire to conquer things on my own, they're both positive traits, but they, all co they also can be really limiting and pretty dangerous, actually, as I found out. As leaders, we can fall into this trap. We think we should know all the answers. Our ego believes that asking for help will expose us when in fact, it's a necessary skill. It'll enhance and broaden our reach. So one fall morning, I was at work. I wasn't feeling particularly well, but as I'd done many times, I ignored it, kept working. What I didn't realize was I was bleeding internally. I nearly passed out on the bathroom floor. I struggled back to my desk. My heart was pounding. I was struggling to breathe. I was in a cold sweat. I, I literally sat there for a couple of minutes just trying to get my composure. And as I'm sitting there, my rational brain is saying to me, you need to get to a hospital. My irrational brain on the other side is saying, you need to drive yourself to the hospital. Thankfully, I never made it to my car. Actually, one of my coworkers found me at the bottom of a stairwell. I had to stop to catch my breath and they drove me to the hospital. I had no idea how serious this had become until I saw a panic look on a nurse. The phone rang, my blood test came back and she stood up and looked at me. I was on a gurney outside of the nurse's station. She said, you lost 50% of your blood. They immediately started transfusions. They rushed me into surgery to stop the bleeding. Now, looking back on this, what a stupid, stupid thing to do and dangerous. I mean, looking back on it, it's kind of embarrassing, actually, when I think about it. I didn't want anyone to know what was going on. I was really embarrassed. I didn't want a big commotion. But this selfish behavior, it could have resulted in a disaster. I could have hurt myself. Worse, I could have gotten into an accident on the way to the hospital trying to drive myself and hurt somebody else. But in hindsight, what I learned was this ability to ask for help, it really is a strength. It's not a weakness. Frankly, it's harder to ask for help than not. And when I put this in the context of a work setting, it drives home the point that when our actions are driven by vanity or ego, we run the risk of doing damage to ourselves, to the business, to the people around us. As leaders, we really need to um, be sure that when we're looking at a situation we're not allowing our ego to make those decisions. 
leaders think we should have all the answers. We should be able to handle any situation that's thrown at us. But in reality, the higher up you go is something I've learned. You need more help. You need more support and more guidance. It's all the stuff you need to handle what is increased responsibility, increased pressure, increased demands. We need to be humble and ground that decision-making in the overall objective, not, not just what's in it for us, but the desired outcome. What do we need to do? What's best for our teams? Maybe our family, maybe your organization. It's hugely important you don't let vanity or your ego drive those decisions. So let me pop my screen up again, see if I'm getting any better at this. So this one, again, I think ego is the big player here, right? And your vanity. Are you worried about what people are gonna think of you? Are you worried about getting exposed when you're making your decisions? Very important that we make sure we understand that. What do you need that you're not asking for help? I'll bet we all have something. And do you have the courage to ask for that help? And are you fostering a culture in your organizations that values that strength of asking for help? Or are people afraid in your organization to be asking for help? Again, some things to just dwell on think about. All right. We're coming down the home stretch here, folks. Thanks for bearing with me. All right. Final lesson for today. Uh, this one I call resilience is a journey. So in 2019, I had my last surgery. Thankfully, right before the pandemic hit, um, I look back on that and thankful for that. Uh, I once again come to the end of the road on my medical options. My condition could only be resolved by major surgery. Uh, I was very experienced at surgery, but I have to say it was still pretty devastating blow to find myself in this situation again. Turned out it would be much worse than I thought. The initial surgery actually went pretty well, but within two days I developed a lot of complications. I ended up spending a full month in the hospital. I was supposed to be there for three days, I think. Um, much of that, and a lot of pain, very, a lot of discomfort. I couldn't uh, eat or drink anything for a full month. They had to put a central line in my arm to feed me, just to keep me from wasting away. And I remember it was the beginning of the third week that I was in the hospital. I think it was a Monday morning. It was truly one of the lowest points of my life. I was completely exhausted. I was in pain. Nothing was working. I was really losing my resolve. I laid in that hospital bed. Uh, I had called home for the last couple of weeks and I honestly laid there and just cried. That's an honest, honest answer. I was angry. I was afraid. I was exhausted. I was really losing my fighting spirit. Now, mind you, I've been through this four other times, so this is not new to me. Doesn't sound very resilient though, does it? Well, that's when the text and the phone calls started coming in. And friends and family flooded me with messages of support, encouragement, concern. They came to see me, boost me up. Even the nurses on the floor, I'd become friends with them. I had been there for so long and they started checking in on me more often. What I didn't know was my wife had sent out the word I needed help. And when I couldn't hold myself up anymore, my personal team held me up. They all rallied around me. I had this amazing medical team. They determined the only way to get me back home was to do yet another surgery. Now I left that hospital uh, one month to the day that I went in. And eight weeks later, I was back at work. Uh, I ended up taking on another CFO job. We ended up doing 12 acquisitions in 18 months with chaos. And we created an entire e-commerce division within the business we were in. We ended up selling that to Omnicom for nearly a billion dollars. On top of that, six months after leaving the hospital, I started to run um, 
like I said, I was a runner in high school, but really hadn't run much since that point. And I just started running and kind of like Forrest Gump, I never stopped. Um, I've actually logged 2,600 miles of running since my surgery. I could probably have run from New York to California by now. Not only that, but I'm running at speeds that are uh, same times as people about 20 years younger than me. If anybody had told me that I would end up at this point, and my health would be better than it was probably 30 years ago, and I'd be running 2,600 miles, I would have never believed it. And there's a lesson in that. Sometimes it's just not your time. This happens to be my time, I guess. I'm doing pretty well. It's not how many times you get knocked down. It's how many times you get back up. Now, resilience, sometimes people mistakenly take resilience as a one-dimensional thing. If you're resilient, you get knocked down, you continue to get up, even in the face of dire circumstances. But in reality, getting back up, that's the end result of a resilience journey. It starts with a mindset. Don't use excuses. Don't let it stop you. But you need to own your own situation. Remember, you ultimately have that choice to decide how to approach the challenge. You need to know when to grind it out and when to protect yourself. Sometimes resilience requires you to put your head down and just push through whatever's in front of you. I'm sure everybody's had those 3 a.m. nights where they're pushing through work and sometimes it's hard, sometimes it's painful. But equally as, port as important is there are times when I'm gonna use a boxing analogy, you have to put those gloves up. You have to protect yourself. You have to give yourself that enough time to regroup and figure out how you're gonna get through what's in front of you. Sometimes you just can't power through it. You need a support team. That's a team you would do anything for and they would do anything for you. You have to cultivate that though. What you put into that, those relationships is what you're gonna get back out of them. Don't expect people to rush in and help if they don't know that you would do the same thing for them. And when we think of our teams, are we that supportive of our teams that they would jump in and help us? If you build these relationships, ask for help, but don't abuse it. Remember, this is ultimately your situation. It's not theirs. Don't put it back on them. You need to take good care of yourself. This is something I've learned over the years. If you're going through a particularly challenging time and you've got nothing left in the tank, your ability to be resilient is just not going to be there. It's going to be very hard. You need to be kind to yourself. Work on that mental fitness as much as that physical fitness and pay attention to what's truly important in your life. Sometimes we lose track of that, especially when we're in really tough times. You need to train for resiliency like an elite athlete would train for a match or a race. It's not what hits you. It's, it's your ability to absorb it. So that is my fourth lesson. Let me just pop up my last slide for you. Two slides. So I just wanted to share, this was a quick shot of me running. This is a five mile race um, that I did a couple of years ago. There were um, 3,300 people in this race and uh, I beat about 2,500 of them. Not bad for a 60 year old guy. Um, and this has been something that's really helped with my mental fitness as well as physical, obviously. So lesson four, how do we build these resilient teams, right? And the first thing I would say to you is you need to put yourself in a, a, a position to be resilient first. If you as a leader are not resilient, do not expect your team to be because they won't be. And you need to demonstrate it by example. How you approach a problem, how you choose to respond to that challenge, how you rebound, they'll all watch that. You need to foster that culture of support. Make it part of the DNA of your team. They're there for each other. Everybody will jump in if somebody else needs it. And you need to foster that culture of positivity. 
Positivity is probably one of the best ways to keep a resilient team. If you're always negative, if your team's always negative, it will drain you. And then you'll be in that position where you've got nothing in the tank. Celebrate those accomplishments. Again, be positive. Have some fun. My God, work's too tough to not have a little bit of fun. Show appreciation a lot. Don't be afraid. Some people are afraid if they show appreciation, then people want more. Don't worry about it. If somebody does a good job, appreciate it. Support your team. Support their efforts to get their mental fitness and their physical fitness uh, in good shape. And all of this is you're going to create this reserve that when you're tested, when that final time comes, when something really hits that team, they'll have the reserves, they'll know they're supported, and they'll be able to uh, overcome whatever it is that comes their way. Let me stop sharing again. Hope I haven't bored you too much with these. Um, Anyway, so those are my four lessons. Um, I wanted to just thank everybody for listening. I, I hope it's been helpful. Again, this is kind of a experiment sharing such a personal story. But what I'd like to do is just close up uh, with a quote. And this is actually my own quote, but um, the strength of the human spirit, it's only known when it's tested. And I want you to know you're far more capable, far more resilient than you think you are. I think I have some authority to say this. The challenges, limitations, obstacles, we face them every day. They're opportunities to reveal that strength, that true strength. Thank you all again. Really appreciate listening. And um, I think we've got 15 or 20 minutes to do some questions. Well, before the questions, uh, Kevin, I just wanted to say uh, thank you for an amazing presentation and sharing your uh, very personal story with us. Well, thank you. Appreciate appreciate the invite. Yeah, this is David here. I would say the same thing, and I assume that that's the purpose why we've had the honor of having you here. Uh, myself and I'm sure others are going through some very challenging times, a lot of self-doubt, et cetera, et cetera. And I'll be very frank, everything you've told us is of great importance and great value to me. So great. thank you very much. Thanks. Nothing, nothing could make me happier than to hear that. No, that's true. Big help, big help. Thank great. you. Yeah, that's one of the reasons I wanted to bring Kevin on. Um, I've known him now for almost 20 years and just super excited that uh, you see these people in your life that you work with and you think they're just successful uh, people in, in, in large, large companies living in the U S and then all of a sudden you realize you, you find out their struggles and you say, Holy smoke, this is going to, um, this has got so many le lessons into what, you know, we're all trying to do with our own businesses and, and our own challenges. So, yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Kevin, for this. No, you're welcome. And I think, I think you, you hit on a point. I mean, this is why you can't allow that inner critic to take you over because frankly, you're probably doing as good as the, the guy next to you or the one that you think is doing so well. Right. Uh, you never know. You never know what's going on behind the scenes. I always say that about businesses like, you know, well, you guys work in multiple businesses, but anybody that's worked in multiple businesses, um, you realize every business is screwed up, right? When you walk in, everybody's got their problems. Everybody's got their challenges. You know, you think everybody thinks, well, Apple is a great company, right? I'll bet you $10 we go into Apple, we'll find a bunch of craziness and some real big challenges to deal with. So you can't let it overwhelm you, that negative voice. Hey, Kevin, very impactful, motivating, and inspiring story. Absolutely. Thank you. Kevin, yeah, I want to thank you so much for your for your time and, and uh, sharing, again, the, the personal story with everybody here. And like you mentioned before, uh, a lot of, um, you know, people can, can relate 
as far as the imposter syndrome and inner voice thing, especially with the industry that we work in, where um, a lot, uh, you know, being a finance, you know, financial person or an accounting person tends to drive a lot of introverted people and re reserved people, which is why I'd like to ask, um, you know, did you find yourself? I mean, obviously, you you had your um, your child your health challenges to constantly remind you and 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 push yourself, but as, you know, were, were there any other things or exercises or go tos that you would do to kind of you know shut shut down that inner voice or help you um, you know get out of the imposter syndrome mindset? Yeah. Well, I mean, first of all, like I, I mentioned, that inner critic never goes away. And that's something you can work on for a long period of time. Uh, but the one thing that that I always did was um, I always looked for an opportunity to do something uh, beyond what I was doing. And, you know, that, that Hyperion job, uh, while that was brought to me... Um, I always liked a new challenge. And, and frankly, if there's anybody in finance that is looking to expand, you know, beyond finance, I would say that to me, the, the biggest piece of advice I could give you is get involved in sales. And I don't mean be a salesperson because you're probably got a day job, but get as close to the sales organization as you can. Go out on some sales calls, get friendly with some salesperson and go out on sales calls. Understand, I think when you're in finance, you're a little bit insular sometimes. You're on the inside looking out and getting that view of the customer and what they're thinking and, and understanding what you sell. I, I had a uh, CFO working for me uh, before I stopped doing my CFO job. And one of the objectives I put uh, for him was to be able to do a, a sales pitch for me. He had to sell me the product that the company was doing. And you would be amazed at how much that will, one, it'll expand your perspective. And two, it will put you in a different light with all the people dealing with you because you'll understand the other side. You get so many people in, in businesses and they're like, oh, the salespeople get everything and they get all the commissions and they get the trips and they get this and that. Try being a sales guy. You know, you're selling your own business now, but it's not that easy. And understanding that customer, that's when you start elevating yourself to want a more of a strategic thinker. Don't be Thank afraid. You. Don't be afraid to try. Those are easy ones. Get friendly with a sales guy and go out on a go out on a sales call. It's not too hard. Kevin, how do you look through or manage through uncertainty? any framework you use like because of your health challenges and issues yeah. you're looking through that you yeah know, what's your mindset at that stage or you know what framework yeah uh, i don't know if i would call it a framework i think it's i think it goes back to um the mantra of you know no excuses right the the first thing that you could do when something pops up uh that's unexpected is you can start blaming other things or other people for for this thing, you know? I don't know. I didn't get a promotion, right? You start blaming your boss. Doesn't understand, right? Well, I think the first thing I do is I always turn inside out, right? I go, I go on the inside and say, okay, how am I showing up in this situation? Is it is it something I'm doing first? Or is it something that is happening on the outside? And as far as uncertainty goes, if you have a mindset that uh, things will change, it's just what you do, um, it's a lot easier to handle things unexpectedly. I think, again, as finance people, we try to control everything, right? We try to get everything in, in, lined up in a box, no uncertainties, right? Um, change is really hard. We don't want change. But the reality is it's going to happen. And, and frankly, one of the things I learned about business is any business that isn't growing and changing will die. It will eventually die. And so that change and growth, you have to find a way to be energized by that instead of demotivated by that. It's really important because um, 
without without that change in growth, I've seen tons of companies go down the tubes. And the ones that are real opportunities, if you're looking for opportunities, those are the ones that are changing all the time. I don't know if that answered your question. No, 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 perfect. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Kevin, I think the way you have mentioned in managing the inner critic and tapping into the strengths was brilliant. Mm, thank you. The rational brain, the irrational brain example was, it was, it resonates very well with a lot of uh, professionals for sure. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things, well, for me, for me, to sh this, frankly, this is the first time I've done this, um, sharing this story. So your <laughs> congratulations, you're the first ones to get it. But um, one of the reasons I wanted to do it is because I think the perspective that I have from having these very, very difficult periods in my life, being able to share those alongside of, you know, sometimes you you hear a presentation or you go to a training or something and things don't resonate, they don't stick. Uh, and I just felt like if I could share a, a, a real life story and tie that into some of these lessons that hopefully it would be something you could carry away with you. And it's, you know, you'll, you'll remember that story uh, more than you'll remember a PowerPoint. I, I don't know. I hope, I hope that, that, that that's the way it goes, but that, that's what my thinking was. And frankly, after 40 years of, of going through a lot of really tough stuff, um, it'd be really great for me to be able to use that and help some people out. So that's another reason I'm doing it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hi, Kevin. Uh, this is Shiraz from New York. Uh, once again, uh, uh, you're sharing personal stories and the intent with which you have shared is just amazing. I mean, it shows your indomitable spirit uh, with which you want to share that. So it resonates with people. And this day and age, uh, you know, in our society, especially in America, you know, this is always hidden and so many of the CEOs as well, because many of them are going through their own trials and tribulations, if you will, but it takes a lot of courage uh, and boldness to come out and share these kind of things. And so kudos to you for having done so. And just one thing that I would like to know, apart from this aspect of your, you know, indomitable spirit or courage, uh, to keep pushing forward, what was something else that truly mattered that kept you going? Because uh, there's always what you call what matters most mm, or what yeah. counts. Yeah. And what was that intrinsic thing? And you know, feel free to share it, or if you if it's personal, it's okay as well. But I just want to no, no, because I... I have been through some of those kind of challenges myself. But there was something that kept me going, and I was just wondering if it was the same as mine. Yeah. Um, well, look, I'm an open book, right? I wouldn't I wouldn't be here if I wasn't. So I'm happy to answer a question like that. Um, pinpointing that what you're describing is very difficult. Um, I don't know. You know, I've always had a, a bit of a drive in me. <clears throat> My family is extremely important to me. Um, uh, and making sure I was there for them and, and, and showing up for them. Um, that certainly is a driver for me. Um, now, you know, uh, if I wanted to just take the easy route and frankly, you know, like I said, curl up in a ball in the corner, I mean, I wouldn't have a family, frankly. Um, and, you know, I, I feel like I've done a pretty good job of, of supporting them and, and, uh, and that's incredibly important for me. Um, I, you know, I, I've always wanted to succeed. And, and frankly, when I first started this journey, I, I didn't want anybody to know what was going on with me. And so I think I tried even harder, um, to, to counteract that. And, you know, when I said, you, you know, you have to invest in, in your support network, you know, like at work, the one thing I always felt like I had to do more when I was in good shape, right? When I wasn't sick, because I knew that there were going to be these times I'd have to lean on people. 
And so I'd put in the extra effort when I was good, knowing full well that, you know, inevitably I was going to get hit somewhere along the line. I, I mean, I had two different um, instances where I was out on disability for six weeks at a time, um, just crashed and really had to take a break. That was kind of my analogy of putting those gloves up. Sometimes you just have to do it. But I think, you know, it was building those reserves, building that credibility. Um, you know, one thing I would say, and this is kind of, you know, it's it's kind of funny people that know, you know, would know me and you know, know of my illness, you know, they'd say, so how are you doing? And the reality is they don't want to know how you're doing, you know, other, other than people like really close to you. Right. They don't want right. to know. It's they're doing yeah. that because they're being polite. Right? right. Yes. And so if I answered that with, well, you know, I was, you know, <laughs> tired, and you know, you you're not these people, they're not gonna want to stay around you for very long, right? Right. So right. so this is this is this whole concept of you can't put it on them, right? Right. It's your thing. You gotta own it, right? right? And I think I've 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 always taken ownership and, and trust me, when I was very young, my parents took a, a lot of beatings on this because, you know, I, it took me a while to get to this stage. But I think taking that ownership and you think about employees that you had, the ones that come to you and they're, they're solution people, right? The ones that come to you and everything is terrible and everything it's, you know, why is this happening? Blah, blah, blah. Who's the go-to person that you go to? You go to the solution person, right? You're not going to go to the person that's that's complaining and and whining, and you know it's so it's that it's it, that's why I say it's a mindset. You have to have yeah. that mindset because, frankly, people get tired of you. Again, I truly appreciate and applaud your uh, sharing your story, and wish you nothing but the best. Oh, thank you. you, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Uh, Kevin, this is Don. There was a note from Anne. She asked a question in the chat. Uh, Daniel, if you don't mind asking on my behalf, he said, given the unpredictability of your illness and varying energy levels, uh, can, Kevin, can you share your thoughts on how it impacted your career planning in mm -hmm. terms of roles with varying levels of demand? Also, yeah. any tips on how you improved your ability to ask for help given a level of independence? Uh, you may be used to? Mm, that's a great question. Um, yeah, it, unpredictability is is big with me. Um, and honestly, I think one of the things that, that I did is, you know, obviously, you know, we talk about an inner critic, right? You have to, there is another thing called the voice of reason, right? And they're two very different things. Inner critic is negative, right? They're They're just coming up with negative things, why you can't do things. Um, the voice of reason is factual. This is, you know, okay, you, you know, you're going to take on this job. It's going to require you to, you know, travel three weeks a month and you have a young child at home or you have an elderly parent you have to take care of. Well, that's the voice of reason. That's maybe you shouldn't take that because you've got these other responsibilities that you have to do. So you have to, you balance this voice of reason. And frankly, you know, uh, I went, you know, I've been in the C-suite for 14 years, right? I've been working for 44. So it took me 30 years to get there. And there was a bit of zigging and a little bit of zagging. But ultimately, you know, I when I was feeling like I could handle it, um, I would take it. And, you know, letting those opportunities go by. The, the, problem, the problem is if you are always waiting for that next shoe to drop and that's what you're focused on, you'll never do anything, right? There's always going to be something that can potentially happen. Now, I happen to have a chronic illness. It happens a lot. But frankly, any one of you, something could happen to you, you know, at any time, right? And if you focused on that, you would never progress. You'd never go beyond where you are today. So I think, again, there's a mindset there. Sometimes I had to, you know, take care of myself more than, than I usually do. You know, sometimes I was fatigued. Sometimes I was sleeping on the train, not doing emails on the way to the city. You know, sometimes I was doing meditation. Um, you know, sometimes I was taking days off to get to a doctor. Um, but in the end, uh, and I think this is 
for me now, this is one of the reasons I'm sharing is because I have hindsight now to be able to look at those two resumes. And if I, if I put the medical resume up first before I started my career, I'd be like, forget it. There's no reason to even start, right? Because of all these challenges. Knowing now that I could do it and I could get through it, um, I think it's important. Sometimes you just have to take the take the leap. So hopefully, hopefully that answered your question. Yeah.